Okay, good afternoon. You are welcome to the AAE 536 High Speed Dynamics uh, video lecture, recorded video lecture. Today is um, the 29th, is it? Let me check. Sorry, today is the 30th of January 2015. So the course, as we discussed before, is going to be based on modern compressible flows with historical perspective. The textbook, the second edition of the textbook written by John D. Anderson. The slides which I'm going to be showing, um, um, they've been made from the textbook. So much of the material is from the textbook. Uh, as an introductory thought, you've done aerodynamics, uh, aerodynamics before and uh, incompressible aerodynamics before. And when we were discussing about incompressible aerodynamics, we noted that incompressible flow was is a flow in which the density remains constant or is assumed to be constant. Uh, some kind of revision of uh, the definition needs to be done because in real life all flows are to a lesser or greater extent very um, to a lesser or greater extent compressible it just now depends on how much you want to you want the compressibility in the flow to affect um, the results which you want how much you think it's the such compressibility effects might affect uh, the results of any calculations you are making so an incompressible flow is uh, more appropriately defined as one in which the effects of the change in density is assumed to be negligible because in actual fact, we can't have a 100% uh, incompressible flow. <clears throat> and to, to uh, make, to bring that into life, I'm going to share um, one, online um, app. It's a kind of app. I don't think it's an app. You can also visit the website and try to, to see what I'm saying. That's the URL there. I think it's, yeah, it's some kind of app on NASA government's website. Anyway, it shows the various um, length scales of matter in the whole universe. Uh, so, right now, right now, in this, um, in this kind of, kind of, um, length scale, uh, we have, uh, human beings. You can, um, let's just, Try to read what's written there. So the explanation: What does the universe look like on the small, on small scales, on large scales? Humanity is discovering that the universe is a very different place on every proportion that has been explored. For example, so so far as we know, every tiny proton is exactly the same, but every huge galaxy is different. On more familiar scales, a small, on more familiar scales, a small glass able to talk to a human being is a vast plane of strange smoothness to a dust might. I suppose you get what um, we are talking about now. And just with the app, we're just going to be um, um, comparing the different kinds of skills that uh, we have. We have the macroscopic uh, skill, which is the kind of skill that we as human beings, we can see with our naked eyes, and then we have the mi microscopic scale, which is that which we can't see with, the, with our naked eyes unless with the use of very strong microscopes. <clears throat> so, in the app, and we know that uh, the particles of fluids, particles of solids, they are all on the microscopic scale, those that we can't see with our naked eyes. 
we are going to try to see, um, of course, we know from chemistry that um, uh, all gases or all um, kinds of matter are made up of electrons, uh, protons, uh, molecules, and all that. So we are going to try to use this app to have a kind of a real feel of how how those things uh, really come about, or maybe how they really are. So if you look at this scale here, we see that that's a human scale. That means the macroscopic scale. Of course, you can see a giant S1 without the use of the microscope. You can see um, the, the dog there without the use of the micro, micro, microscope. <clears throat> well, if we were to go like further into um, a step further, of course, we can still see a hummingbird there. But a hummingbird is very, very small. The match stick is very small, smaller than uh, the basketball or any other thing on this scale. So we go there, we go even further, and then we can see uh, uh, an ant there. Some, some of the ants are very small, very, very small. They seem very tiny, but you can still see them. That means we are going from the very macroscopic to uh, microscopic bit by bit. And then we go in over there. There's uh, um, something of salt, grain of salt. So that's a grain of salt. You see, as you feel that the salt is just in powdery form, if you take it just uh, a tiny part of it, a, a, a single grain, that's on the scale that it is. So the scale of an amoeba, uh, a dust mite, and all. So we are gradually going into the microscopic scale. And you see the thickness of paper, you see how it's how it is in relation to the grain of salt. So, and even now we are still not on the very, very microscopic scale. We are not on the atomic level yet. We still have to go further inwards. So we keep going further inwards. So this is what is of interest to me here. The mist droplets. You know what mist is? It's just EV. In Badula Rangan, those tiny droplets are mist droplets. So, and you know, of course, it's made up of water. So the mist is a kind of. Uh, um, so when we start talking about fluid elements in uh, compressible flow, we can liken such an element of fluid to the mist droplet. So to better understand the behavior of the fluid element and then the mist droplet. I'm going to try to delve in more into what exactly might be contained inside the mist droplet. So that means we are going to go uh, further into the microscopic level beyond uh, that on which the mist droplet is. So we we'll go further. We see that we can still find things that are smaller than the mist droplet. So we we'll go for the and we are not even um, um, on the atomic level yet. So if we go further and further and further and further and further and further, now we get to the atomic level. So in a mist droplet, a mist droplet. You see, it's, it's on the microscopic level. It's um, maybe you might not even be able to see a mist droplet, but um, when compared to uh, the atomic level, you see that it's like a very huge volume because that means in a mist droplet, we have millions and only God knows the amount of molecules and atoms of hydrogen and oxygen. This to be precise, water molecules contained inside the mist droplets, all going around in some kind of motion. 
And the water molecule is even bigger than hydrogen atoms. So in a mist droplet, which is just uh, in a mist droplet, which is very, very comparable to the fluid elements we'll be talking about, we have millions, uncountable number of hydrogen um, water molecules, that is hydrogen, two hydrogen atoms with oxygen all fitted to, together. So we have all this moving all around. So that's what a fluid element feels like. And we know that um, uh, water, solids, liquids, and gases are different just because of the kind of interaction, molecular interaction that is in between their molecules. For solids, the molecules are tightly bound together with very strong intermolecular forces, which gives a solid rigid structure. For liquids, the intermolecular structure is not is less rigid. The intermolecular forces are not as strong. So there is a kind of fluidity that comes into play for liquids. That means the molecules, each of the water, this is like a single water molecule. It's not tightly bound. If this were like the mist we are looking at, we would have some other water molecules all around. The forces putting them together are not so strong. So each of the molecules are, have the liberty to move or slide uh, about the other ones. And for gases, the intermolecular forces are even very, very, um, very, very uh, weak. So if this were some gas or if it were water before, you would have the water molecules going on around and not uh, being held together uh, with any kind of strong force. So immediately what comes to mind now is uh, the concept of density. That means in a given volume, how much of this kind of molecules do you have? Like for, uh, uh, so for solids, of course, the density is so high because you have so many molecules densely, um, still using the word density, you have so many, so many molecules put together into a very, very small volume. When it comes to uh, liquids, the molecules that are put together in a given particular volume are not as many as uh, what you have in a very dense solid. So, of course, that means the density of liquids are usually lower than those of solids. And when you now even want to compare with gases where the molecules are all around, we see that the density of gases are uh, less than means that if there was some kind of way we could close up those gaps in between them, we would be able to reduce, no, sorry, we would be able to increase their density. And that is what we mean by uh, compressibility of a gas, because they are, the, the space between the molecules, are, uh, there are spaces, enough spaces between the molecules, so there is still enough room to keep putting more and more molecules together. That means you can be closing up the gap if you apply as much pressure. That means as you are closing it up, the density will be changing. It will be increasing. As you are reducing the, the pressure you are using to compress it, of course, the molecules have more space to move around in, and then the density will be decreasing. What we should also note here is the fact that with the little application of any kind of pressure, you can be closing up the, uh, the space, decreasing the volume, the density will be changing. If the, the force is uh, 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 modestly released, then the space becomes bigger, and then the molecules have uh, uh, so many space, with so much space to move about. The density is always uh, changing with any kind of flow. So that is why an incompressible flow, a truly incompressible flow, is just a myth. But if the density is changing on this very, very small level, on the atomic level, we might not be really considered, or we might not be really concerned about such very small changes in density. However, sometimes when the changes in density is so much, 
because the pressure the pressure bringing about such changes is so high, or the pressure change bringing about such changes in density is so high. Of course, the change in density might not be quite macroscopic, and uh, if the effects of such changes in density are not taken into account, then it could lead to errors in calculations. So, if we now go back to uh, the slide and continue our discussion. So most flows of liquids and low speed flow of gases fit into this definition. If liquids, as I've, as I've tried to explain, uh, 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 they are fairly incompressible. The space between the molecules are not as much as you have in gases. But there are still, there are still some spaces. That's why the liquid molecules can flow over one another. So if you apply much force, you can still kind of like close the gap. But you need so much force to even make any appreciable uh, closing of the gap. So usually on the macroscopic level, liquids can be thought of as being um, uh, or the flow of liquids can be thought of as being incompressible. And for gases, when the, the speed of the flow is not as strong or it's not as fast, then uh, we, we don't have as much pressure changes to bring about the much uh, change in density that would bring any kind of error into calculations if it wasn't taken into account. The engineering fluid dynamics programs of the 18th, 19th, and early 20th centuries are almost always involved, uh, uh, or, or almost always involved uh, uh, those speed flows of liquids and gases. So they were incompressible flows. So uh, the famous Bernoulli equation, which you know and which you experimented about, was um, 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 was. Um, uh, was useful then because if uh, you do P plus half of this squared equals constant on a streamline, that means you do P1 plus half of V1 squared equals P2 plus half of V2 squared. You are just assuming that as you move from one point on the streamline to the other, the density remains constant. <clears throat> but I'm just trying to explain to you that you can have very, very little variations in density, but for when the when the flow is uh, doesn't have that much speed, then the little variation might not bring about the much changes on the macroscopic level that uh, might be considered some kind of error if those changes were not taken into account. So, in high speed flows, the famous Bernoulli equation in the form that it is written in one point one. Uh, accurate. In 1893, uh, the Swedish engineer Carl Dolabal uh, exhibited the steam turbine engine, and the, the steam turbine was driven by high speed, um, of course, steam uh, uh, um, being fed into the blades. And uh, the, the action of the high speed steam rotated the blades at so much, uh, so great a speed that they hadn't ever seen before then. That kind of flow wasn't incompressible. Of course, it was uh, the compressible flow of uh, steam. And that opened the way for uh, the operation, the design and operation of supersonic wind tunnels and rocket engines and all that in the later centuries. And by 1947, the first um, um, the first uh, supersonic aircraft had been designed, and um, Captain Charles Chokliga, that's his name, flew faster than, faster than the speed of sound. Let me try to get a better picture from the internet. Yeah, so you can see. The plane better here. 
and that was the first thing that flew faster than the speed of sound. So uh, the one of the main reasons of flying faster than the speed of sound is the bellex of XS1 was um, uh, to understand uh, the new, um, if you like, the new classification of flows, then compressible flows. And such kind of flows include the internal flows through rockets, gas turbine engines, high speed supersonic, transonic, supersonic, hypersonic wind tunnels. And just once, the, uh, usually once the mass number is greater than 0 0.3, then you can assume compressible flow. So we start by having the, de the definition of a compressible flow. Of course, it's in the layman language and just from the words, we can say compressible flow is a variable density flow. So like I tried to explain, then if you consider a small element of fluid, like the mist droplet, the volume is, uh, uh, take the volume to be V, then we can define the compressibility of uh, that mist droplet as tau, as tau, and then when we define it like that, uh, if there's some change in pressure dp, some change in pressure dp over the surfaces of the mist droplet, that means uh, we know if there is some pressure imbalance, you have some kind of flow. Uh, from the knowledge equation, as the pressure is reducing, the static pressure is reducing, the dynamic pressure is building. That means once the static pressure is reducing, you have some you have some kind of flow. Because if the dynamic pressure is increasing, or if you have some kind of dynamic pressure, that means you have some velocity. So that means when uh, the, the, the static pressure is reducing, or maybe when there's some pressure imbalance somewhere in the, in the fluid, you are bound to have some kind of flow. So we are now going to define compressibility based on uh, some kind of change in pressure dp, and then the consequent change in fractional change in the volume of the fluid. But we know that when the pressure is increasing, when we are increasing the pressure on, say, the mist droplets, you are closing up the volume. That means the volume will be reducing. And that is why there's a negative sign there. So we define compressibility of the fluid tau as a negative fractional um, change in volume by the change in pressure. So fractional meaning that uh, after you might have compressed it or after it might have gone through some kind of uh, compression, the volume uh, you have then, uh, you subtract it from the previous volume and then divide by the previous volume, just as it has been written there. So uh, we know that when you are uh, compressing uh, uh, some gas. If you want to express this better, the next time you go to um, fill in your gas cylinder, you can try this. When uh, the gas is being filled, of course, when you put your hand around the cylinder, you feel that uh, it's, the temperature is going up. So, uh, um, of course, by compressing the gas, you are trying to put in so many uh, molecules into a, a confined volume. The molecules which are moving all around with so much kinetic energy will now be confined into a single, um, a much more confined space. And such molecules will keep bombarding the um, uh, the walls of the cylinder, thereby impacting their kinetic energy on the walls 
as they are impacting the kinetic energy, they are kinetic energies on the walls, they are transferring such energy in form of heat. So that is why you have um, uh, uh, the temperature around the um, around the walls of the uh, cylinder to be um, going up. So you can, for this reason, you can have the definition of the uh, compressibility in two ways: isothermal compressibility, which is defined as uh, tau sub sub t equals uh, the fractional partial derivative of, uh, no, sorry, the partial derivative of volume with uh, pressure at constant temperature over uh, the volume. Because if uh, when the molecules, like in the case of uh, uh, compression of gas I was talking about, when the molecules are bombarding the walls of the container, they lose their energy to the walls and then lose from the walls the energy is transferred to the um, uh, environment. Once they, they lose the energy, the kinetic energy, their kinetic energy reduces and then uh, the temperature also reduces, the temperature of the fluid also reduces. But you are still compressing and compressing. So actually the temperature should be getting higher. But because the molecules are losing their kinetic energy from the, uh, by bombarding the walls and uh, the energy transferred from the walls to the surrounding, there is, um, because there is constant transfer of energy from the molecules as you are compressing them to the surroundings, the temperature will be kept um, uh, almost constant. So we have the isothermal compressibility. So we know that when you are compressing some gas and you allow the gas to be losing energy to the surrounding, then the temperature is going to be fairly constant. So uh, you have the isothermal compressibility defined there. But then you can have a system whereby when you are compressing the gas, you are not allowing the uh, energy, the energy of the gas to be lost. That means you but probably you insulate the walls of the uh, container so that the energy of the gas, the energy the gas possesses before compression is uh, uh, conserved. It's not transferred. You have some adiabatic uh, compression. When you have adiabatic compression, that means there's no heat transfer. So there's no loss in energy. And then when the compression takes place without any other kind of dissipative phenomena like uh, viscous effects, then it's the, the process will be reversible. And we know that isentropic process is one which is both adiabatic and reversible. So we can then define the isentropic, com isentropic compressibility as tau s equals minus one over v partial derivative of v with pressure. <clears throat> as we know from intuition, the compressibility of uh, liquids are very low as compared to those of gases. So in terms of density, the compressibility is given as tau equals one over rho dp zero, and this is because this is because we know that rho equals the inverse of uh, volume. So we know that rho v equals one. So if we decide to take the derivative of this equation using product rule, we know that that will be V zero plus rho dv equals zero because the derivative of one, which is a constant, 
is equal to zero. So immediately we see that B J rho will be equal to minus rho dB. And then we can just separate the variables to have um, D rho over rho equals minus dB over V. So if we now write tau equals if we write tau equals minus one over v there v del p there v del p that means we can just substitute in the row the the row over row for minus del v over v and that is what we have there so we have one over rho the rho over del t so and that is how come we have equation one point five so immediately we see that the ch the change in pressure is just equal to the uh, the density of the fluid times the compressibility of the fluid times the change in pressure. I mean, the change in density equals density, the previous density, initial density times the compressibility of the fluid times the change in pressure. You see that um, large pressure gradients usually create large velocity gradient. That means when you have so much we have so much pressure gradient, we expect to have so much velocity gradient. That means we, have, we expect to have so much velocity changes. So that means when you, when you are considering a very high speed flow, you know that there are so much gradients of pressure. Uh, if it were to be a very high speed flow of liquids, you know that liquids are very, very low values of compressibility. So that means the change in pressure, the change in density may not be that much, even though you have a very large change in pressure. But because the compressibility of the fluid is very, 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 very low, then uh, the large change in pressure does not give you that much change in density. But for gases, gases have uh, um, considerably high values of compressibility. So that means when the pressure gradient is quite large, you can have a corresponding uh, change in pressure, or sorry, change in density, which is high as well. So when the pre uh, density is changing, immediately we can see that uh, we can see that Bernoulli's equation, Bernoulli's equation will break down because Bernoulli's equation says P plus half rho half rho V squared equals constant. That means if the fluid element where to be flowing in a streamline like that. And I want to know, uh, I know the pressure here. And then um, I know the pressure here, P2, let's say here the pressure is P1. And then at this second place, the pressure is P2. The pressure is P2. Uh, let's say I know the velocity here, V1. So I don't know what the velocity. I don't know what the velocity there is. So if this, um, if this were low speed flow, like incompressible flow, I can just apply the Bernoulli equation and say P1. 
P1 plus half rho V1 squared equals P2 plus half rho V2 squared. So for the sake of the discussion now, let me name the rho, uh, the density as rho 1 and then the density there as rho 2. For me to be able to obtain a value for V2 uh, with this equation, that means I need to know P1, which I've just said probably I know now. Then I need to know V1. I need to know the density, the value of the density here. Let's say it was given as well. And then I need to know P2. I said it was given. I need to know uh, uh, rho 2. I need to know rho 2 as well. If it's a low speed flow, I can just assume that rho 1 should be equal to rho 2. That, that shouldn't be much changing density. Then I can just use the value which was given here for the value of the density there, and then I can calculate for V2. Well, if you now have very, um, uh, if the, uh, the speed of the flow is so high, the density has changed so much from there to there, then row one will not be equal to row two. And it would be wrong to use the Bernoulli's equation then. So that is the reason why we need to now find other means to deal with such flows. So you define a compressible flow as, um, uh, or you, we say compressible flow will be considered as one in which the change in pressure dp over a characteristic length of the flow multiplied by the so the change in pressure dp over the, some characteristic length of the flow multiplied by tau and the density uh, multiplied by tau results in a fractional change in uh, density that is the rho over rho which is just too large to be ignored so for most uh, practical problems, if the density changes by 5% or more, the flow is considered to be compressible. So this is a much more technical way to discuss or describe compressible flows. So, uh, Let's see more going on. So next we talk about flow regimes. <clears throat> we know that of course this you you're already familiar with you're familiar with a subsonic what the subsonic flow is, you know what transonic flow is, supersonic flow and hypersonic flow. So I'm just going to quickly like um, brush over them. You have to recall that uh, flow properties like pressure, temperature, density, and velocity are all point properties. That means they vary from point to point within the flow field so that um, uh, the, the value of pressure or temperature at a point A in the flow field might, be, might not necessarily be the same as the value of temperature, pressure, whatever they will be in another uh, points in the flow. So the speed of the speed of sound, which is directly related to the temperature of the medium, is also uh, varying within the flow field. So that the local Mach number, Mach number being the ratio of the speed of uh, the object over the speed of sound, will also be varying at every in, at every point in the flow. Hence, we can now define flow regimes. The subsonic flow, which is uh, drawn in figure 1.3a, 
to the kind of flow in which uh, the mark number is less than one at every point in the flow field. That means at not even at any single point, the speed of uh, the, uh, the mark number equal to the speed of sound. When you have mark number to be equal to one, that means the speed of the object or the free stream uh, speed is just equal to the speed of sound. Then a trans a sonic flow, of course, is then uh, a flow in which the speed of the object is just or the free stream velocity is just equal to the speed of sound. A transonic flow is one in which um, uh, the characteristics of both the subsonic and supersonic flows are mixed. That means you have regions of uh, subsonic as well as supersonic flows. That means uh, there are some points where the flow is subsonic and then some points where the flow is supersonic. Particularly when you are increasing the uh, the free stream velocity over, let's say, a curved surface, let's say the curved surface of an airfoil, the curvature of uh, the airfoil will accelerate the flow more, such that the velocity at some point there is greater than the free stream velocity. So if the free stream Mach number is already uh, around the speed of sound, then that means at some point around the body when the flow has been accelerated more, uh, the local Mach number might just be uh, equal to one or greater than one. So that means you have some kind of some pocket of supersonic flow somewhere even though the rest of the flow field might be subsonic. This kind of flow field is called a transonic flow field. And when you increase the Mach number further, but still around one, you have this kind of flow. So you have a bow shot. You know what a bow shot means as we go on. So for now, just consider it as a discontinuity in the flow across which the flow properties vary sharply. So you have the local Mach number varying from above one to less than one. That means the flow. The region of flow directly behind the shock, a normal shock wave, uh, is subsonic. So now you have supersonic flow coming, you have subsonic, and you have supersonic all around. Um, uh, so this is a mixed flow, subsonic plus supersonic. So you have the transonic flow regime. A supersonic flow now implies one in which at every point in the flow field you have the local mark number to be greater than one just like we have in figure 1.3 g at every point in this flow field the mark number is greater than one these are oblique shockwaves you know what they are later on better so now they are oblique shockwaves the flow across the oblique shockwave um, uh, this flow is still supersonic after the shock wave. So the Mach number, the first Mach number for me is supersonic, and then the uh, Mach number after the after the uh, shock wave is also still supersonic. Then hypersonic flow is one in which the local Mach number is greater than one everywhere in the flow field, and the uh, the the speed of the flow is so high enough that the uh, molecules of uh, the uh, gas are started dissociating and ionizing. And I hope you still remember what dissociation and ionization means. It just means uh, uh, let's say, for instance, it's the flow of, uh, of course, the flow of air. Uh, air is majorly nitrogen, so you have N2 molecules in the air. By the time you you start having the speed to be so great, so that the N2 molecules are dissociating into the individual atoms, then you are talking about the hypersonic flow. When as such 
point, you can't make um, assumptions of perfect gas or uh, 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 isentropic flows or all that anymore. So uh, then you have a hypersonic flow. It is not, uh, there is usually not a clear boundary uh, with which you can determine when you have a hypersonic flow. Most people might say that, okay, when the flow is, when the local Mach number or the frequency Mach number is greater than five, then you have hypersonic flow. But really, this depends on some other physics of the flow and the body geometry. So the correct, um, 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 the correct description of the hypersonic flow is a, a supersonic flow in which the flow, the free stream map number is high enough for dissociation and ionization of the gas molecules in the flow to have significant effect in the flow field. So we go on. Already we see that uh, high speed flows then have a lot to do with transfer of energy because we talked about the temperature increasing and decreasing and doing all that. So if uh, high speed flows are, are high energy flows, then we need to be talking about thermodynamics, which is the science of, uh, or yeah, thermodynamics is a science of. Um, um, uh, which centers on this uh, study of energy. So, a perfect gas, uh, in thermodynamics, we usually talk of a perfect gas. And here, uh, we continue um, talking about it. A perfect gas is just one in which the intermolecular forces have been neglected. Uh, just like when we started the lecture, I was trying to uh, explain what um, what a, a mixed droplet contains. I heard contains so many molecules. So those molecules are, uh, we were talking about have intermolecular forces in between them, and the intermolecular forces are such that when the molecules are uh, close together, they uh, they tend to repel one another. But when they are a distance to one another, they tend to attract themselves. So in real gases, the intermolecular forces are there, but sometimes it's just easier to neglect the effect of such intermolecular uh, forces of repulsion and attraction uh, uh, to make uh, engineering calculations easier. So when we neglect uh, such effects of intermolecular forces, in a fluid, particularly gases, then we are talking of a perfect gas. And then uh, for most flow applications um, that we'll be considering in high-speed um, high aerodynamics, compressible flows, the temperatures and pressures are, um, are moderately uh, uh, valid such that the assumption of the perfect gas is valid. Uh, uh, the equation of state for a perfect gas is the product of pressure and uh, the volume is equal to RT, where R in equation 1.8 is the universal gas constant, and T is the temperature. If noting that, of course, V is the reciprocal of density, you know, we see the famous way uh, uh, the equation of state is usually stated. P equals rho RT. There are, however, other ways you can, um, or the equation of state can be stated, ranging from equation 1.10 to 1.15. We need to also recall the concept of internal energy and enthalpy. Internal energy of the gas is the summation of the constituent energies of its individual molecules and particles due to their random motion and vibration. When I was showing you, we can go back to our app and go in there and we see 
the water molecule, the carbon atom, we see that the electrons are in constant motion around the nucleus. And um, for instance, the water molecule here, the water molecule here is um, moving and vibrating some of, along with the electrons moving all around. So uh, for them to be moving, they must possess some kind of energy. So the internal energy of a gas is just the summation of all these constituent energies all the particles it contains have. So the uh, uh, the the energies, the, the vibrational energies, the energy they possess to be moving around, uh, that is the kinetic energy, and all, the, then we have to think about the potential energy and all that. That is the internal energy of a gas. And then we have, we have the enthalpy. <clears throat> So uh, if the particles of the gas, which we call the system, are moving around affirmatively in, in their state of maximum disorder, that means there can be no other, um, um, uh, there is no gradient of temperature or pressure in the flow field, then we have the system to be in equilibrium because once there is some gradient of temperature or pressure and there will be uh, movement to, uh, uh, to cover up for the pressure variation or the temperature variation. Or when everything is already in the state of maximum disorder, then the system is in equilibrium. So for equilibrium systems of real gases, we can also define the enthalpy to be the summation of the internal energy and then uh, the product of uh, pressure and volume. Here, the internal energy is usually a function of temperature. Internal energy E is a function of temperature and the volume of uh, the gas. And of course, once E is a function of temperature and volume of the gas, it can be seen that enthalpy would be a function of temperature as well as uh, pressure of the gas. But if, if the gas is not chemically reacting, we can always ignore intermolecular forces and then the system is um, now regarded as a thermally perfect gas. Thermally per perfect gas, for internal energy E and enthalpy are functions of temperature only. And then uh, the specific heats at constant volume and pressure, CV and CP, are functions of temperature only. So when we have when we have neglected the effects of intermolecular forces, we are talking about a perfect gas, but uh, the um, the internal energy and then the enthalpy are still functions of temperature. So we are talking about a thermally perfect gas. Then we can define the specific uh, heat at constant volume. Specific heat is just the amount of heat that needs to be added by units to raise the temperature of the gas by uh, a unit at constant volume. So the E the change in internal energy of the gas is equal to CV dt, where CV for a thermally perfect gas is a function of temperature alone. And likewise, the H equals CP dt. So the temperature duration of CV and CP is associated with the vibrational and electronic motion of the particles, such as what I showed with the NASA app. Then if the specific heats are constant, that means if CV and CP are not functions of temperature, they are not varying with temperature, then the system is called a calorically perfect gas. Calorically perfect gas. Then E 
is just equal to CB2 and H is equal to CP2. In most, we find that in most uh, compressible flow uh, applications, the, uh, the assumption of a calorically perfect gas is in order. The temperatures are not as high enough as to make CB and CP functions of uh, the temperature. So we can always assume a calorically perfect gas until they are, uh, they are, uh, the temperature is too high enough uh, for CB and CP to start varying with uh, temperature. And we can also um, define um, R to be the difference between CP and CV. Of course, where CP is the H delta T and CV is the E delta T at, at, at constant volume, CP at constant pressure. From equation 1.20, we can manipulate it to have this expression for CP and then that expression for um, CV. For instance, if we divide through by CP, you have 1 minus CV over CP equals uh, R. And then if we now define the ratio of the specific heat to be gamma, we can directly get expressions for CV or CP. Usually, gamma is equal to 1.4 for air at standard conditions. And then we recall the first law of thermodynamics, which is embodied in equation 1.24, that the heat transfer across the system boundary uh, by uh, maybe direct radiation or thermal conduction plus the work done on the system by the surroundings is equal to the change in internal energy of the system. That's the first law of thermodynamics. And we can uh, we note that uh, there are, there can be various processes uh, through which energy might be transferred between the system and the surroundings. Where we are saying it might be due to radiation or thermal conduction or any kind of other means. The there can be various ways in which what what can be extracted or done on the system too. And that's why we have partial derivatives here because these are dependent on um, these are dependent on the, the process that brings about such energy transfer. But this is a total uh, derivative because it's a state uh, uh, um, e internal energy is a state variable. It's um, no matter. It doesn't depend on the process. So if the process increases uh, the internal energy or if it decreases the internal energy, it's just there. It's, it's not dependent on uh, the process that comes about. So that's why it's the E. So immediately we can then define uh, an adiabatic process to be one in which no heat is added or taken away from the system, a reversible process as one in which no dissipative uh, phenomena occur. And such dissipative, dissipative phenomena can be in form of viscosity, thermal conductivity, or mass diffusion. So when all these dissipative phenomena uh, do not occur in the process, we, call, we are talking about a reversible process. And that means uh, the, the process the initial state of the process can always be recovered because nothing has been dissipated. That means if you want to go from uh, state one to state two, uh, if you are going from state one to state two, you can always go back from state two to state one because everything has been conserved. And if you are, if you have that, then you have a reversible process. So the process which is now both adiabatic and reversible, is called an isentropic process. Well, uh, uh, if no heat is added or taken away, 
and if all the uh, uh, the energy of the flow is conserved, uh, there is no dissipation of the energy, then the entropy of the flow is going to be conserved. So that means the entropy as this one is just going to be equal to the entropy as P2, and then uh, uh, the flow, the process of flow will be called an isentropic process. For the reversible process, it's, it can it can be shown in most um, thermodynamic literature that um, the change in uh, the work done, the change in work done, is also called the negative P dV. So dV is just an incremental change in specific volume due to the displacement of the boundary of the system. So that means we can rewrite the statement of uh, the first law of thermodynamics to be del Q minus P dV equals V. Well, we just substituted minus P dV for del W there. So uh, if we go on to assume the processes are diabetic as well, then that means the whole process is isentropic, and then we can get, uh, we can go on to get the isentropic relations. The second law of thermodynamics introduces the concept of entropy, and entropy is just the degree of the disorderliness in the system. Entropy, the concept of entropy is usually used to uh, gauge the direction in which a thermodynamic process is going to occur. And entropy is defined so that the change in it, the S, is equal to um, the change uh, in heat added reversibly to the system, added or taken away reversibly to the system uh, over the temperature of such heat transfer. So that uh, in an alternate form, you can also define it as ds equals the Q over T plus ds irreversibility. Because it is, um, we know from a physical experience that there is always some form of irreversibility within the system. And there's always some form of uh, dissipation of the energy of the flow or the energy of the fluid when a process has just gone on. Because you are always, for instance, always going to have viscosity coming into play, and viscosity always dissipates the energy that a system has. So that is what gives rise to, uh, or that is what makes us be able to write um, entropy in this form, in the equation 1.26. Uh, so we have the S irreversibility to be greater or equal to zero. If we would have a 100% process or a 100% reversible process where viscosity, for instance, is not there, then the S irreversibility is just going to be equal to zero. But like I've just said, new processes almost always increase the entropy because of irreversibility in them. So the S irreversible, irreversible is uh, greater or equal to zero. So um, that means the S is greater or equal to the Q over C. So if we now go on to insert, uh, that if the S Equal, uh, the S greater or equal to del Q over T, that means we can find an expression for del Q in this equation. Del Q is just going to be equal to T dS. Uh, it's just going to be equal, uh, I think it's going to be less or equal to T dS. So that means we have a way to calculate entropy. If we put, we're calling that, um, let me switch to my camera. Okay. 
recording that before we had the OQ plus del W equals DE. We noted that for for an irreversible for a reversible process, the W is usually shown to be equals to P D V. And then we had the Q plus sorry minus P D V equals D E. Now we've just seen that the um, Q that D S is greater or equal to del q over t and now we are going to assume that uh, the process is also uh, adiabatic sorry that the process is um, uh, reversible so that we have the s equal to uh, no, sorry, we are just going to take the equal sign from this equation. That is, we are going to say it implies that del Q equals C D S. I hope this is not blurring out. It's clear. So del Q del Q equals T D S. We can put this then in place for in place of del Q in our equation so that we have T D S minus P D V equals D E. But then we can recall that H equals E plus PV, that is the enthalpy. If we differentiate this, we have the E equals the, sorry, the H equals the E. Then plus V dp plus p dv so that if we bring all this to that side we have the h minus v dp minus p dv equals de and then we can take we can take this equation and put it into this one so that we have CDS minus PDV equals the H minus VDP minus PDV. So minus PDV can go out and then we have CDS equals the H minus VDP. So we have an equation with which we can directly calculate our entropy given that we know the temperature, the entropy variation, the volume, and then the pressure change. So so we have equation 1.32. And then we note that uh, for a thermally perfect gas, we have the H to be equal to CPDP. We can substitute that into the equation which we just derived. And when we do that, we have equation 1.33. We do that and then we divide through by T, we have equation 1.33. Then uh, if we try to now find a way to treat um, this portion of the equation 
that if we want, in order to be able to do the integration, we need to have um, this portion of the equation in of the equation of the function in the p in p. We have to have it as a function of p. But so if we use the perfect gas equation of state, noting that p v equals r t, we can find an expression for v over t, and that is just r over p. So when we substitute that into the equation, we have equation 1.3 for where the S is equal to CP dt over T minus R dt over P. And that means that at least we have all the variables separated and we can take the integration, uh, we can perform the integration from a state to another. So that means to calculate the entropy change when the process has just gone on. We just integrate, and then we have S2 minus S1, assuming S1 was the initial state, and then S2 was the final state. And equal to integral of CP dt over T minus R bin T2 over P1. Uh, we are not taking CP out here because we are still assuming a thermally perfect gas in which CP is supposed to be a function of temperature. So that means equation 1.35 holds for a perfect, a thermally perfect gas. Or if we assume CP, uh, if we assume a calorically perfect gas where CP is a constant with temperature, then the CP can just go out of the integral sign. And then we can evaluate this integral which is lean T. That means S2 minus S1 equals CP lean T2 over T1 minus R lean P2 over P1. If you do a similar thing using DE is equal to CD dt on uh, um, uh, uh, on our previous equation, our energy equation, then we have a, a similar expression for the calculation of entropy uh, as in equation 1.37. <clears throat> well, for an isentropic process, we are assuming that the change in uh, entropy is equal to zero. That means S1 is just equal to S2. That means the equations which we've just been able to get now should be equal to zero. So if we take the first one and equate it to zero, we have CP in P2 over T1 minus R in P2 over P1 equal to zero. That means we can equate one part of this equation to the other. And then when we do that, nothing, uh, when, we, when we have done that, we noting that CP over R is equal to gamma over gamma minus one, we get the wonderful, uh, expression that for an isentropic process, the ratio of the pressure is equal to the ratio of the temperature used per gamma over gamma minus one. We can do the same thing for the second equation for the calculation of entropy, and then we arrive at the fact that the ratio of the densities is equal to the ratio of temperature used per one over gamma minus one. These two can be combined these two, I mean equations 1.39 and 1.42, can be combined together to uh, uh, can all can be combined together to get equation 1.43, which is the equation which governs isentropic flows. Note the assumptions which we have made here. We have made the assumption that the flow or the process is reversible and that it is adiabatic. And if it is reversible, and if it is adiabatic, there will be no change in entropy. So it's an isentropic flow. So if uh, uh, you have a process where you can assume it to be isentropic, then this relation will be, um, will be uh, valid. But let's look at uh, this do we know that viscosity is always present in nature. So in the flow of any kind of fluid, 
we expect to have this scarcity. And sometimes we might have um, uh, some energy being taken away from the fluid or some energy being uh, put into the fluid. How then or when exactly can we have that entropic uh, flow? Maybe it's just a myth or something. But then we know that um, when you have the flow over a body, there is usually a thin region adjacent to the body where the effects of viscosity, thermal conductivity, and then mass diffusion is highest or greatest. So, and that's the boundary layer. That means the flow outside the boundary layer is usually, uh, we can usually be considered to be reversible without loss, without much loss of um, accuracy. And then if there is no mechanism to directly be heating the flow, let's like, consider the flow over the wind of an aircraft. If there is no mechanism to directly be heating the flow or taking away heat from the flow, then we can assume the flow to be adiabatic. So adiabatic plus reversible just means isentropic. That means the flow outside of the boundary layer is can be safely assumed to be isentropic. And in such case, the, the isentropic relations embodied in uh, equation 1.43 is valid. So we go on to recall that the aerodynamic forces on a body are due to two sources, the pressure uh, distribution on the on the body and then the shear stress distribution on the uh, body. We therefore note that an integration of uh, the pressure distribution and then the shear stress distribution are over the body surface gives us the aerodynamic force on the body. And once we have the aerodynamic force on the body, like see the air for here, we can now uh, resolve it into the component perpendicular to the free stream, that is the leak, and then the component parallel to the free stream, that is the drag. It is just important to record this because uh, the whole um, concern of aerodynamics, the sort of aerodynamics, is just to be able to predict the forces that the motion of air over uh, them of the forces that the motion of uh, air over, uh, over bodies create. So that means that, uh, that is just what we are concerned about. So in compressible flows too, we want to see uh, uh, the effects of uh, compressible flows around bodies. That means we want to be able to predict the pressure variation and then the shear stress variation in order that we are able to now integrate such uh, um, uh, pressure distribution and chest rate distributions around the body and get the forces of interest. So in a kind of summary, mini summary, we see that compressibility is defined as the fractional change in uh, volume over change in pressure. And then we can also define it in terms of um, density. When we do that, we can find an expression for the fractional change in density uh, to be equal to tau times the P. And then we know that compressible flows uh, uh, pertain to flows at Mach number from 0 0.3 to infinity because we know that uh, we just we stated earlier on that usually when the flow mark number is greater than 0 0.3, then the compressibility effects are quite not negligible. Then we have to figure them, we have to factor them in into any kind of calculation. And then high speed flows are compressible flows and they are high energy flows. Then that means the, uh, the study of thermodynamics is uh, important for the study of compressible flows. That was just a minute summary. Then we have to then look at the integral forms of the conservation equations for inviscid flows. In order to be able to predict 
the distribution of uh, fuel properties, we need to write, uh, we need to kind of like write the word in, uh, or get the equations in which the word is written. Because of course, uh, the pressures are related to the velocity, to the temperature, and some, some kind of functions. So it's always, uh, uh, in order to be able to now predict the variation of these uh, properties, um, we need to appreciate the fact that the world is written in mathematics. <clears throat> so the approach that has been taken, or usually uh, been taken to get um, these functions or to get the way uh, these properties relate to one another are listed in uh, the bullets one, two, three. Um, firstly, you choose the appropriate fundamental physical principle from the laws of nature. The first, of course, is mass is conserved. The second is um, conservation of momentum. And then the third is uh, conservation of energy. Then we apply the physical principles to suitable model of the flow. We note here that uh, it is important to get a suitable model of the flow because for a fluid which can flow, you don't have a definite uh, shape. You don't have a, a, a rigid shape. So there must be some kind of model um, that we, we use to define the motion of uh, fluid then. The motion of uh, fluids is not as, as, as trivial as one can think uh, the motion of solid objects can be. So, and uh, from the incompressible dynamics, we know that uh, the approaches which are used are the final control volume approach, infinitesimal fluid element approach, and the molecular approach. approach. The first two approaches, final control volume approach and then the infinitesimal fluid element approach are uh, by far the most widely used. But when you do, um, the, for the molecular approach, um, um, the, the laws of uh, the fundamental physical principles are used on molecules and then uh, the integral effect on the whole volume of gas is um, derived by some kind of statistical uh, means. But for the final control volume approach, a control volume is drawn within the uh, flow field and then the physical principles or the fiscal laws are then um, um, used to analyze the flow inside the control volume. For the infinitesimal fluid element approach, a fluid element, just like uh, uh, maybe the mist droplet or smaller than the mist droplet that we were talking about, will be considered. And then the uh, physical principles, laws of nature, will now be uh, used to analyze its motion. So either of the three approaches should result in the same uh, 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 results because, of course, the three approaches are trying to model the same thing. However, the, they can have varying, um, uh, one can expect that uh, depending on the approach, the results may be more accurate than others. Then the third thing you do after um, uh, Choosing the appropriate fundamental fiscal principle, applying it to the uh, fiscal, applying the fiscal principle to the suitable model is to uh, derive the mathematical equations go governing the fluid flow. We already saw all this in incompressible dynamics anyway, so we know that we, when we did what was what was said to be done in one and two, uh, we got. Um, the continuity equation, the momentum equation, and then the energy equation. So it is just been stated here for a kind of review. If you are not comfortable enough with these equations, 
uh, this page, you are advised to go back and then look at them more. Continuity with patients just means math can uh, be neither created nor destroyed. So that means the mass flow into the control volume should be equal to the time rate of change of uh, mass inside the control volume. And then for the momentum equation, we know that the Newton second law says F equals MA. That means if you have the summation of forces, the summation of forces will be equal to the momentum, the rate, time rate of change of momentum of um, uh, the fluid. So this can the time rate of change of momentum of the field, either if it's the control volume as um, uh, these are triple integrals anyway, or it can also mean for a field element, so we try to distill the integral equation into the partial differential equations. And then the energy equation is just a statement of the first law of aerodynamics, uh, sorry, of thermodynamics that the heat and then the work should be equal to the the change in heat, change in work, plus the same work should be equal to the change in internal energy of the flow of the fluid. Then we need incompressible flows, high speed flows. We deal with um, one dimensional flows uh, uh, a lot. So we need to look at what one dimensional flows mean. Um, we note here that uh, uh, shock waves dominate, uh, the, uh, dominate supersonic flows. And like I said before, a shock wave is just a region of discontinuity in the flow feed through which flow properties change drastically. Uh, usually we can have a detached normal shock wave. A detached normal shock wave, such as the one depicted in figure 3.1a, is called a bow shock. A bow shock because it looks like a bow. A bow, um, it looks like a bow. You know the arrow and bow thing. So that is a bow shock. And it usually occurs um, in front of blunt most bodies in supersonic flows and it's usually detached from the body. But for pointed nose bodies, like um, uh, that which is depicted in figure 3.2b, sorry, 3.1b, you have attached oblique shock, oblique shock waves. And that is because uh, the, uh, the shock wave was uh, has some kind of angle of inclination relative to the body. So that is why they are called oblique shock waves. A bow shock then can be seen to have uh, to be um, uh, a, a combination of normal and oblique shock wave because at the very front of uh, the the nose of the um, of the body, the the detached shock is uh, nearly normal, and then as the flow as you move away from uh, the front nose of the body, we have it's bending, so it's like a combination of oblique as well as bow shock, shock waves. Normal, a normal shock wave is, uh, of course, like I said, is perpendicular to the free stream direction as illustrated in figure 3.3. The flow through the normal uh, shock wave reduces the velocity of the flow. That means the map number uh, if the flow were from uh, if the flow flows from one station one here to station two, then through the shock wave there, a normal shock wave, 
then the mark number would have reduced to the low one, that is, it goes from supersonic to subsonic. Of course, the velocity will have reduced, but then the density will have increased, the temperature will have increased, and then the pressure will have increased. Normal shock waves are very good examples of one dimensional flows because the change in the flow properties is usually just in one direction. So that is why we, we call, we say there are very good examples of one dimensional flows. Oblique shock waves are two dimensional phenomena. If, uh, then we can de define a quasi one dimensional flow. A flow which, when you say quasi one dimensional flow, that means it is in real life not a one dimensional flow, but because of some assumptions, uh, we can make, uh, we can now model it as a one dimensional flow. So, for instance, the flow through uh, the uh, fluid element or like a cylinder here will be a one dimensional flow because then A is constant, the area of the cylinder is constant, and then the variation of the fluid properties is just due to a special variation on the x axis. But when you have the area to also be varying with respect to x, then as you move from one portion to the other, the area is varying, but um, the variation is modest, it's not abrupt, it's not sudden. Then uh, uh, the variation of the flow properties can also be thought to be uh, functions of the coordinate space, one coordinate uh, direction, uh, the x axis. So when you assume that the uh, the flow properties are still functions of just one dimension only, just because the area of uh, bounding the flow is modestly varying in that direction, then you have a quasi one dimensional flow. So we are going to now try to use this expressions of continuity, momentum, and energy equations uh, on the one on one dimensional flows to get the relations that govern one dimensional flows. Okay, so now we we'll try to derive the one dimensional flow equations. In order to do that we use figure three point five. We consider the flow through the shaded one dimensional region, which is representative of the normal shock wave. <clears throat> normal shock wave, that is the, the part of the, sh the power shock wave, which is just perpendicular to the flow direction. That is, like I sh showed before, like I showed before. Uh, so like I showed before, let's say you have the airplane and you have the shock wave there and then the flow direction is there. So that portion of the shock wave where if you blow it out you see something like this. And the flow is just perpendicular to it. That's the portion we call the normal shock wave. So we can just assume a, a one dimensional flow there and then try to draw a control volume around the normal shock wave. And on this control volume, we are going to use the uh, governing equations in the integral form. So, uh, 
So the flow properties are a function of x changing from state one to state two. So in order to calculate the changes in the properties of the flows, uh, then we need to apply the integral conservation equations to the rectangular control volume. Take the area of the rectangular control volume, that is the cross-sectional area, to be A, where A is just, uh, and for this control volume, we are taking a unit depth into the slide. So, um, in order to go with our um, analysis, we are going to make some assumptions. And some of the assumptions are that uh, there is uniform flow on both sides, and, and also that if, if it is uniform, that U is not varying with height on both sides. That means we're taking a control volume small enough such that the, there is no variation on velocity in the vertical axis. It's just uniform in the X axis. Stations and one of the other advantages is that stations one and two are equal area. Equal area is A, which is perpendicular to the flow. That is the area A equals the area A, and both areas are perpendicular to the flow. And then we are going to assume that the flow is steady, that there is no variation of this flow properties with time. And then we are going to assume that the body forces are negligible. Examples of body forces are um, uh, uh, gravity, force of gravity, electromagnetic force, and all that. But here we are going to assume that there is no, usually of course there will be some uh, force of gravity. But now we are going to assume the effect on and the effect of such force is negligible on the flow. So the flow is in the x direction. And usually before we proceed, before we proceed, I want to note that when you have a, um, a volume, drawn, then uh, the elemental unit vector, the elemental surface unit vector, is always pointing out in a direction perpendicular to the face. So that is, the elemental unit vector at any point on this top uh, face of the fluid element is always be pointing up. There and over here, it will be pointing to the right. Over there, it will be pointing to the left. And over here, it will be pointing downwards. That is, it's always pointing outwards of the uh, outwards from the surface. If the surface is bounding some kind of volume, then the unit, the elemental unit vector, is always going to be pointing outside of the volume. So going forward, we now invoke the continuity equation. Uh, because we are assuming steady flow, this part of the equation goes to zero. So we are just going to be left with the integral of the mass flow rate is equal to zero. That just means that the inflow is equal to the outflow. So we need, in order to get the one dimensional equation, we need to evaluate this on all the surfaces of the control volume drawn. So, uh, and then we need to know that uh, the velocity is dotting the um, elemental uh, surface vector. When you have some um, the dot product of two vectors, uh, uh, I mean, 
I just want you to record that the dot product of two vectors that are perpendicular to one another is equal to zero. So if uh, the two vectors are parallel to one another, you just have to multiply uh, the magnitude in, uh, of the vectors in the direction of interest by uh, one another to have the dot product. So if you still record the dot product, applying it on um, the control volume, <coughs> So now we have the one dimensional discontinuity which we want to analyze. I think this thing is blurry. Uh, might be better this one. So we have drawn a control volume around it. And I have told you that. If you recall that the elemental unit vector is always pointing out of the control volume. That means on this case, the elemental unit vector is pointing to the left. It's pointing to the left. On that face, it is pointing to the right. Here it is pointing downwards. And there it is pointing upwards. So the velocity is coming this way, U, because it's a velocity in the X direction, and it's going that way in that direction, U. Here, because the flow is uniform in the x direction, we don't have any component of the velocity coming out from here. So v, which is a component of velocity in uh, y direction, is equal to zero there, and then v equals zero there as well. So if we try to now do the integral rho v dot ds, where V and the S are vector quantities. We will note that yeah. and the area of the surfaces we said is A. So on this space, the unit vector the S is pointing to a different direction uh, to where U is going. So the dot product then will give us a negative value. So that means um, minus rho U A. So the minus is, to, is there to serve the purpose of showing us that the S and U are not in the same direction. They're not in the same direction. So we have uh, an inflow denoted by the negative sign. And then on this space, the S and U are in the same direction. So we have rho, rho U A rho u a and uh, if we look at this space uh, v uh, is part the v the s is uh, coming out here and v is in that direction that means the s and v are perpendicular they are perpendicular so that means the dot product will be zero on this space as well as on that space, because V, which is in uh, the, it, which has components only in the x direction, is perpendicular to the S on this basis. 
So the dot product of E and the else then will be equal to zero. It just means that there is no outflow or inflow from the upper and lower boundaries. The flow is just in that direction. So this should be equal to zero. And it just tells us that um, rho u, rho 1, u1 equals rho 2, u2. And that is the continuity equation for a one dimensional flow. So we move on to the momentum equation for one dimensional flows. So uh, the integral form of uh, the momentum equation is given as that. If we assume steady flow and we neglect body forces, that means this part goes to zero and that part also goes to zero. We are just left with um, the momentum flow, net momentum flow in and out of uh, in the net momentum flow in to the control volume is just equal to the pressure forces. So we go on to do the integral, noting that uh, the pressure of force is always acting inwards to a given surface. The pressure is always acting inwards to a given surface. If I switch to the camera, and then we quickly look at that again. Yeah, so this is the equation of interest now. Integral of rho v dot ds into v equals integral minus p ds. Pressure we know always acts inwards to a given surface. That means here, yeah, if we look at the control volume drawn again here, on every face, pressure is acting inwards, acting inwards, acting inwards, acting inwards. At any given point in time, the direction of the um, surface unit vector ds is, um, in, is opposite to the direction of the pressure forces. So on all faces. With those are the ds pressure is always inwards. So they are always in opposite direction. So while trying to evaluate these integrals on the faces, one has to take uh, that into consideration. And the, uh, this in the bracket is just going to be uh, evaluated the same way we evaluated the one here. But now we have to note that this is a vector equation which has components in both x and y, x, y, and z direction. But since we are considering only uh, one dimensional flow, we are just going to be taking the x component of this equation. That means, due to one dimensional flows, we are taking rho v ds and u because u is a component of velocity in the x direction, and this will now be integral p x. Yes, that is the pressure we are will be considered is just in the x direction. So with that in mind, sorry, that's the correct way to have written it. PDS into a uh, subscript x just to show that the integral gives us um, 
a pressure force in the x direction. So, when we evaluate the integral on both faces, we come up with this equation here, which just simplifies to uh, equation 3.5. P1 plus rho 1 u1 squared equals P2 plus rho 2 u2 squared. And this is a statement of the conservation of momentum for the one dimensional flow. Then the next is to go on to the energy equation for one dimensional flows. We recall the general statement, the general mathematical statement. Uh, in the integral form for the energy equation there. And then we let um, this part here, let it be equal to Q dot, and let it be the volumetric rate of heat addition to the control volume. It's a volumetric uh, phenomenon. So let's just denote it with Q uh, dot, after Q dot. For static flow with no body forces, then that means this part is going to be equal to zero, and that part is equal to zero. I just left them with equation 3.6. So all we have to do now is to also evaluate this equation on the control volume drawn around the one-dimensional discontinuity in the flow. So um, we need to then evaluate this integral. We should also note then that V dot dS, V dot dS um, will follow the same kind of uh, procedure. Uh, in integrating this on the two faces will follow the same kind of procedure we followed uh, when we were trying to integrate uh, integral of rho v dS on the faces, and same for this part of the equation. So when that is done, and um, I, I, it would be nice if you tried it, you have this equation here, and then you can divide through by a. When you have divided through by A and you have rearranged, you have equation 3.7. Then we can also go further by dividing this part of the equation by rho 1 u1. And dividing this part, that is the left hand side by rho 1 u1, and then the right hand side by rho 2. U2. So in that case, we have equation 3.8. If you note something here, that then rho 1 U1 A is just the mass flow, the mass flow rate, the mass flow rate. That because that is just um, uh, density times velocity times the area. So that means that means you have some volumetric rate of heat addition divided by the mass flow rate. Q this is just Q over T divided by M over T, right? And just Q over T, Q over T multiplied by T over M. The T's cancel out and then you have Q over M. Q over M is just the total heat divided by uh, the mass of the system. And this is just telling you that we have the specific heat added to the system. That is the total heat, the heat per unit mass Q. So that means you can make that substitution into 
the equation here. And then we have to also note that uh, um, rho, rho in this equation is um, rho, of course, the density is the reciprocal of um, um, the specific volume. That means over here, in place of P1 over rho 1, we can have P1, V1. And over here as well, in place of P2, rho 2, we can have P2, V2. When we have that, then we can also recall that H, which is the uh, specific entropy, is equal to E plus PV. That means we can make the substitution of H to equal these two part of the equation. So in the end, we are going to come up with equation 3.9, which is a statement of the conservation of energy for one dimensional flows. This is the enthalpy plus the specific, the specific enthalpy at the inflow station plus specific kinetic energy at the inflow station plus the uh, specific heat addition is equal to the specific enthalpy plus the specific kinetic energy and the outflow station and the energy is conserved. So now we have the continuity, the, uh, the momentum, and then the energy equations for one dimensional loads. Um, you should take a time, you should, sorry, you should take some time to read and digest the content of this slide, which talks about the speed of sound and Mach number. So I'm just going to move on to the next slide then. Um, if you consider the sound wave depicted in figure 3.6, and let the sound wave be moving with velocity a through the gas, the changes across the sound wave can also be thought of as a one-dimensional flow. So uh, uh, the equations, one-dimensional flow equations, which we obtained in the previous slides can be applied to the flow across the sound wave. So uh, like before we define the flow station in front of the sound wave to be uh, station one, and then the station of the flow behind the sound wave to station two. If the sound wave is moving at, um, into the fluid with the velocity of A, that means if we want to now uh, shift the frame of reference to be on the wave front, it will be as if the uh, inflow from station one is moving into the sound wave at uh, some speed A, and then the flow leaving it to, it's, it's going to be as if it's moving with some uh, change velocity because of the changes within the sound wave. Um, we, so we just represent the change in velocity by dA so that the speed of the flow behind the sound wave is A plus dA. Similarly, if P, rho, and T are the uh, conditions of uh, the, the flow before crossing through the sound wave, uh, due to the slight uh, the, uh, changes, uh, if the flow encounters while passing through the sound wave, we have some uh, uh, dP, the rho and the T added to the pressure, density, and temperature. So, uh, so I've already mentioned that the flow to the sound wave is one dimensional. So we can just uh, use the one dimensional flow equations to the sound wave. That means we can just try to draw a control volume around the sound wave and then use the continuity equation 
and then the momentum equation, uh, the momentum equation later. If we use the continuity equation, we note that rho one, rho one, u one is equal to rho two, u two. Rho is there, and then uh, the speed at this point it should be equal to is the speed in the x direction is a. So we have rho a equals um, the change at uh, the pressure, the density at pressure two is rho plus d rho. Then the speed here is a plus the a. So if we and then we must note that um, uh, the changes within the the changes in flow properties uh, while the flow is going through the sound wave are very slight, very very small change because the sound wave is a very very weak wave. So the, the changes the a, the p, the rho, the t are really really very small, They're very small. So that when we expand out this product, products such as the rho, the a will be very very small because it's just a product of something that is extremely small with another thing that is extremely small. So this is just going to be infinite, decimally small and can be ignored. This part of the equation cancels out that part of the equation. Essentially, we have the speed of sound A to be equal to minus, minus rho d A d P. We keep that uh, to be used later or very shortly. So from the From the moment from the continuity equation we are gotten equation 3.11. So we go on to use uh, the one dimensional momentum equation on the sound wave. So same as before, P plus rho A squared because P plus the P plus which this is a pressure at station two behind the sound wave. And that is the density at station two, and that's the square of the um, the speed behind the sound wave. So ignoring products of differential as before, uh, equation three point one two becomes the P equals that. We can now use this and insert it into the the equation we got for uh, this, uh, this, the previous equation we got on the previous slide, and it implies that the A equals that. Uh, sorry, from 3.13, we can get 3.14, and then we can now substitute 3.14 into the equation we got on the previous slide. When we solve for a squared, we find that a squared equals the p over the rho. So this is a good enough um, place to stop and then have you go over all that has been talked about today. When you have done that, I want you to also go over the next slide. That is this one. That one, that one, and this one, and this one as well. So that means uh, in the next uh, lectures, in the next lectures, I will be. I'll be, yes, I'll be starting from, we should go about this, but I'll be starting from slide 37 in the next video lectures. So have a good time and remember to send me your feedback, comments, and questions. Thank you.